Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study together, we'd reached about the sixth verse of chapter 9, Romans 9, verse 6. Now, the great Bible teachers, they always suggest that the, the bulk of theological doctrine has been well treated through Romans 1 and 8 and and so now we have a parenthesis you know 9 10 and 11 and we get back to Christian responsibility in chapters 12 and on now I don't think that that's a good outline of the book in fact I believe chapters 9 10 and 11 are the doctrinal capstone of all that has gone before we've looked at at man's fall we've looked at the fact that God gave up the flesh no part of the plan of God was to redeem the flesh and and that we were then totally depraved totally incapable of remedying our cursed condition and we were amazingly told by the grace of God that we were justified, made righteous without a cause. That having been made righteous, we have some pretty fantastic benefits. Sin shall not have dominion over us. We're not under the law, but under grace. We're indwelt by the Spirit of Christ. We've been born from above, and those who have been born from above cannot sin. The new nature, the new man, cannot sin. And suddenly we find that sin is rampant in our lives, that there's a conflict. And then in the eighth chapter, we saw the victory that's in Christ. You and I don't have any victory over sin. I tried to point out to you that the wonders of chapter 8 really is that we find out that the battle with sin is God's, not ours and we stand before him with no conscious guilt of sin. We recognize that the flesh never does anything good, that it never does anything to please God, but we are new creations in Christ Jesus, born from above by the will of God, not by our will, but God's. And the wonder of that is that all things work together for our good, that we have an intercessor, the Holy Spirit Himself, who makes intercession for us because we don't know how to do it. We found that nobody can lay a charge against us and nobody can condemn us. In fact, not any created thing nor any possible thing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. And the reason for that is the sovereign, omnipotent God who is our God. Man in the majority wants to be sovereign. Most Bible teachers present some aspect of man's sovereignty, though they sometimes don't phrase it that way. But the implication is that God's done everything He can do, and now it's up to you. You are the one who decides whether or not you will go God's way or your way. And just by that much, you have reduced the omnipotent, almighty, eternal God. The great purpose of chapters 9, 10, and 11 is to, to use God's Word to show that the covenant that He made with Israel has not been forgotten. They're covenants of the Almighty God and they will be fulfilled. It looks like, you know, when we ended chapter 8, if not any created thing can separate us from the love of God, well, and then we come into 9, well, what in the world happened to Israel? And I, I pointed out in my last video, there's no chapter division there. The mind, the thought of the Holy Spirit is continuing on with the same thought. Israel, we know, has been set aside in unbelief. Many today wrongly believe God is no longer dealing with Israel, that Israel is folded into the church. 
All of the Old Testament prophecies are made to deal with Israel. The problem is we can't do that if we take language normally. I do not believe that's the way to approach the Word of God. Israel is the illustration of God's sovereignty, and, and we got down to verse 6, not as though the word of the God has taken no effect, not as though the word of God has failed, you'll, you'll, you'll read in many of your translations. That's a perfect tense, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Well, say goodbye to replacement theology. The idea that the church has replaced Israel is, is pretty much destroyed by that one verse. All of the descendants of Jacob are not Israelites. And it goes on. Neither in addition to that, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy, thy seed be called... In Isaac shall thy seed be called, is a quote from Genesis 21. That's what God told Abraham. Abraham didn't want it that way. You know, just let Ishmael stand before me. Man, man I've got a kid 12 years old, and the seed you've promised is Ishmael. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Sarah's going to conceive, and you'll have a son. And it's in Isaac that the seed will be called, not in Ishmael, but in Isaac. God said that. Abraham didn't say that. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the actual seed. Well, that verse ought to be crystal clear to every one of you. You know what children of the flesh are. Abraham, I can't have any kids. The way a woman is passed with me. Can't have any kids. So take Hagar, take Hagar, and have a child by her so that we can have a child. I mean, after all, your name is, you know, father of many, fa father of a multitude. So let's have a child. And you can't tell me that Abraham was the passive recipient of that. You know, they, they must have talked about that several times. Sarah, you sure about this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and you can let your mind run as rampant as you want. I'd like to stick with the Scripture. Abraham married Hagar. The Scriptures declare that Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham to wife. That's what the text says. So he married her and he had a child. That's a legal child. You know, to the extent that you want to leave God's sovereignty out of it, you, you know, you can say that Abraham and Sarah connived to do this or that. You know, if your God isn't big enough to have ordained that before he created the heavens and the earth, folks, I feel sorry for you. There isn't anything, anything that Sarah and Abraham could have done but what they did. You know, and then people always come back, you know, and say, well then, well, you know, how can God hold them responsible? You know, and you have the nonsense that, that suggests that responsibility infers capability. It does not. It doesn't. The only reason that you're responsible, the only possible reason that, that you can set forth for being responsible is because somebody holds you responsible. If there weren't any higher authority involved, you wouldn't be responsible. You're responsible because, because some higher authority held you responsible. It makes absolutely no difference whether you can do it or not do it. The reason that God can judge is because what He ordained is what Sarah wanted to do. And it's what Abraham wanted to do. I don't think Abraham did this against his will. So this was a fleshly operation, okay? I agree, absolutely. But it was in the plan of God. It didn't catch God by surprise. Stop and think for a moment. If your God isn't, isn't that sovereign, how do you suppose he'd write chapter 9 if there weren't an Ishmael? Just think how wonderful and, and how moral Sarah and, 
and Abraham had been. No, no, this is not a good deal. Yeah, I know, Sarah, you had a fleeting thought of this. And she said, yeah, after I thought it through, well, it's probably not a good idea. It's probably not a good idea. So there's no Ishmael. What are you going to do with Romans chapter 9? How are you going to have a physical illustration of God's sovereign choice? What if Rebecca hadn't had twins? I mean, you put, you put all those what-ifs in there, folks, and you destroy, you destroy the Word of God. Do you know why Sarah and Abraham got together and had Ishmael? It was so that the Holy Spirit could have Paul write chapter 9. It was so I could be making this video. It, it's so that you could be here listening to this video. It's so that every pastor, every church, every ministry, everybody could listen. Our God is sovereign, folks. It was so the Holy Spirit could have Paul write chapter 9. And that, and that you and I could have a marvelous illustration. The children of the flesh are not the children of God. You really don't need that, but apparently the Holy Spirit wants to emphasize it. You know that His people were born from above. Nicodemus, man, and here's where I've really gotten in trouble. I, I can't even begin to tell you how much trouble. Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you ought to know that. You ought to know that. Nicodemus knew of Isaac and Ishmael. You're a teacher in Israel and, and you don't know this? It is absolutely mandatory that you be born from above. And as I pointed out, Jesus wasn't telling Nicodemus that Nicodemus had to do anything. He was telling Nicodemus what God had to do, what had to be done. How in the world did we ever get a modern evangelistic movement where God says, Nicodemus, you ought to accept Christ and be born again. He's not saying that, folks. The word must is the must of necessity. It doesn't contradict born of the will of God, John 1.13. Jesus was expressing the must of necessity. You must be born again. If, if I tell you, you you must be saved, I'm not saying you, you have to save yourself. If I said you must be born of a woman, I'm not suggesting that you have to do anything. The must in that text is the must of necessity. The only reason why anybody would argue against that is because they're, they're, they're either unaware of or have rejected outright the truth that we are born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. Nicodemus, don't you know that God's children are children of promise? They're born from above. Abraham couldn't have that kid. Sarah couldn't have that kid. Unless God intervened. Isaac was a child of promise. He was born from above. Born from above. There wasn't a single thing Abraham and, and Sarah could have done to have Isaac uh, impossible. There isn't a thing that you could do to be born from above impossible. You're born by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. And God, God, had Ishmael and Isaac there to teach you and I that. The children of the promise are counted for the seed. Bear in mind, you have Galatians. But ye, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Nobody could do anything to swart that. Isaac was born because God promised him. And you as Isaac was, are a child of promise. But, as then, he that is born after the flesh persecuted him that is born after the Spirit, even so it is now, and it is. But you 
are children of promise, and Isaac is the great illustration of that. For this is the word of that promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Now the word time there in the text is not chronos, where you know we get our word chronology. It's kairos. That does make a difference. Now, I suppose that you can look at that in the English. I, I don't know what your translation says. You know, you could look at that as, well, that time will go by and Sarah's going to have a son at the appointed time. No, it does make a difference, folks. The word kairos clearly indicates that this was God's plan. I believe it, it, it had been planned before he ever created the heavens and the earth before he ever spoke the worlds into existence. He appointed the time when Isaac would be born, just as Paul confirms with the statement that, that uh, and I just pointed this out recently, at least on Facebook, that it was likewise in the case of Paul he confirms that it was God's timing in his life. When he would when Christ would be revealed in him. Folks, and I believe I have every right from scripture to say that before God created the heavens and the earth, he appointed the time when you and I would be born. We are children of promise whether you believe that or not. It doesn't make any difference. Just like the young child in the first Passover, you know, Dad, have you applied the, the blood over the doorpost? Yeah, son, you can go to sleep, you can relax, you, you'll be fine. He's going to wake up alive whether he believed it or not. What mattered was that the father applied the blood over the doorpost and the lentils. So, you, you know, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. You are, we are children of promise. You are born from above, and as new creations in Christ Jesus, you stand before Him absolutely righteous. Righteous. As righteous as, as He. At the appointed time, I will come, and Sarah's going to have a son. You know, and you'll remember she laughed about that. You know, she, of course, denied, you know, laughing. Abraham laughed. They laughed differently, though. Sarah laughed in unbelief. Abraham laughed, rejoicing that Sarah was going to have a son. Now, not only that, I understand that God and His elective decree promised Isaac, but notice God goes on in what He ordained. And not only that, or, or we could translate, in addition to that, when Rebekah also had conceived by one Isaac, the child of promise, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet born, neither having done anything good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now man is going to do everything in his power to make that not say what it says. Before the children were born, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. Why did you do it? If you're not impressed with the fact that Isaac was a child of promise, the only way he could possibly be born was by God's intervention, God's doing, God's timing, God's sovereign purpose and will. I'll show you how the elective decree works. I'll put two in Rebecca's womb, two, not one, two, in Rebecca's womb, and I'll choose one and reject the other. And I'll create a controversy that lasts for generations. 
No, I'm, that's not what the text says. Even though that that is basically the case. That's not the purpose he did it. Or is it? I'll leave that to you to decide. But I'll put two in the womb. I'll choose one, reject the other. Fact of the matter is the elder will serve the younger. Or literally in the Greek, the greater will serve the lesser. Now, the reason we're told by the majority of Bible teachers, you know, the reason that, that God loved Jacob and hated Esau is because he could foresee looking down through the annals of time that Esau was going to wind up a bad guy and Jacob a good guy, and, and therefore he chose Jacob. Now, that all seems to make sense because man do, doesn't like the fact that God would choose one over another. That's just simply not fair. Not fair. That's what I hear all the time. That's not fair. That God would be unjust if he chose someone and rejected someone else. And what is the underlying principle? That God's choice is based on merit. That underlying principle destroys the entire Word of God. And it seems like Christians are unwilling to point that out. If you say it is unfair for God to choose one against another, you're saying that the underlying principle of choice is merit. And I don't know how to put it any plainer than that. But God operates in grace. You know, I wasn't a great baseball player, you know, when I was a kid, and you know, and they they chose up teams when I was a kid in school, and I was usually the last one to be chosen because I didn't play very good baseball. You know, and anybody who was the captain of the team was a was a nut if he chose a kid that didn't play very good baseball. You know, you put me out in center field, you know, somebody hits a fly ball, I'd run forward and it'd go over the wall. You know, and if I decided to run back, well, you know, it, it'd drop behind second base. You don't want to choose a kid like that. So your choice is on merit. And that's all we know, folks. That's all we know. We were raised that way. It's ingrained into our DNA. You choose employees because they work well. You bosses out there, you'll, you've got to agree with me on that. When you work well, you, you get promoted. Our whole society is based on merit. And we naturally bring that principle over into Christianity. And as I have pointed out in the past on numerous occasions, that principle absolutely does not apply to the Christian life. It doesn't. If you want to talk about what's unfair, that's what's unfair. Unfair to the Word of God. So the idea is, you know, is well, that's unfair. God couldn't God couldn't choose Jacob over Esau unless it's based on him looking forward to what they, they do. Well, let's look forward to what they do, they do. Let's do that. You tell me in Scripture where Esau ever did anything really, really rotten. Well, uh, he, okay, yeah, he sold his birthright. That's not very good. Where was Esau... Though, such a terrible guy. Jacob was a crook. But God's choice isn't based on performance. Please, you must understand that if God is unfair in election, that unfairness is based on merit. God doesn't choose on merit. It's grace. We are His children. Not because we're good or, or handsome or rich or... Or, or talented, or, or whatever. We are His children because we're born from above. We're His children because He sowed us. Because we, we're His children because we're His children. We are members of the blessed family of God. So I'm going to put two in the womb. 
not only that, I'm going to override the basic principle that the elder's the boss. The elder's going to serve the younger. It says that election is not of works. Now, how can I hear a minister? And I've heard this, I, I don't know how many, hundreds of times in the 30 or more years I've been teaching the Scriptures. I've heard people teach on this passage of Scripture that, that says God looked forward and saw what Esau would do and what Jacob would do, so he chose Jacob based upon what Jacob did over Esau and what he did. When the very verse itself, folks, look at it. The very verse itself says, not of works. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? If you believe that God looked forward to see what they would do, and on that basis He planned His choice, then you cannot have the rest of the verse, not of works, but of Him that calls or chooses. You don't even have to use reasoning to point that out that if it's based on works, it's based on merit, and if it's based on merit, it's not grace. You don't even have to point that out. The verse itself says that the choice was not made based on works. And yet every sermon I've heard on this passage of Scripture, every one says it's based upon God knowing what these two would do Would someone explain to me when Esau ever served Jacob? I do know that Jacob was a mama's boy, and apparently mama was concerned about Jacob, and, and she heard Esau say that he was going to do damage to his brother Jacob. I mean, I mean, like, like kill him. Okay, that, that's a that's a decent amount of damage. And so she connived, and, and not only had he he. He stolen the birthright. She connived and had him run away to a relative, and he worked there for a few years. And in the meantime, Esau established quite a homestead, and, and which grew in size and power. And when Jacob finally left uh, Laban and came back, he was frightened to death about what Esau might do, and he sent. You know, you know, he he's a great guy, right? He, you know, he sent the women over first. Well, you know, women and children first into the battle. And then he sent a whole bunch of possessions. And Esau said, you know, what are you doing all that for? When did Esau ever serve Jacob? I can't do this from the text. But if I just read loosely in the Old Testament, I almost get the idea Jacob served Esau. But the Almighty Eternal God says, the elders shall serve the younger. Well, I think about that. And I say, well, one possibility in, in my mind is that the birthright passed to Jacob. So it does seem clear that Jacob had the birthright. And, and to that sense, Esau was subjected to Jacob. There's no doubt about that, but it seems to me the verse is stronger than that. In the 11th chapter of Isaiah, the sovereign, omnipotent God says, The day will come. The day will come. That's eschatological. Not only will the lion lie down with the lamb, but Edom, Edom, that's the king of the south, modern day Iran, by the way, which is Esau. <laughs> Look at the 11th chapter of Isaiah. Yeah, yeah, Esau will serve Israel. Esau will serve Jacob. I'm not convinced that the 12th verse isn't prophetic. And in the end, Esau will serve Jacob. I see it clearly in Isaiah 11. I'm, I'm willing to admit that to the extent that Jacob had the birthright, it was present when they were living, but I want you to see the eschatological side of this verse. The ninth chapter of Romans is the absolute statement of the faithfulness of the sovereign God. He's not through with Jacob, and he's not through with Esau. 
He has not forsaken his covenant. We are still under the guidance of the last verse of Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Well, what do we say about these things? As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now that's not a quote from Genesis. The word, as it is written, is a very common expression. It's a perfect passive. I pointed that out before. It was, it was written in past time with the result that it stands perfectly, completely written. Jacob have I loved. Esau have I hated. Now in Genesis, you can look at the account of Jacob and Esau. The quote in verse 13 is from Malachi chapter 1. So we can look at quotes from the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, and we now wind up with a quote of the last book, Malachi. Find that interesting. I want to suggest that there's a reason for that. I believe that God not only inspired men so that they wrote exactly what He wanted written, but they also they, they oversaw the organization of the books. And so we've gone all through the Old Testament. And the statement in Malachi chapter 1 is, the reason you know that I love you is I hated Esau and I loved you. Does that make God unrighteous? Before I leave the 13th verse, 90% of the Christians I've talked to that doesn't mean 90% of, of Christians, but the ones I've talked to would read this verse, as it is written, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I loved less. And that's the normal approach. Most, in fact, most of the commentaries that I have suggest that, that, that hatred means to love less. And if, that, if hatred means to love less, then I don't know what love means. If you're going to destroy the word hated, you cannot possibly mitigate the word hated without doing something to the word loved. If hated doesn't mean hated, then love doesn't mean loved. It's right together. And I can't do that to the Greek. I recognize the, the normal appeal is to Luke. Anybody that doesn't hate their mother and father doesn't love me. I believe those words were are just as clear as they are here God absolutely loved Jacob didn't didn't matter that he was a crook didn't matter that he connived didn't matter that he cheated God loved him and hated Esau and the power of the of the verse 13 is not because of what they did or didn't do he didn't love Jacob because Jacob was worthy of love and he didn't hate Esau because Esau was worthy of hatred and that's basically what the human mind wrestles with. Clearly, the scriptures have divided mankind in several ways. There's Jew and Gentile, but they're also God's children and Satan's children. The weed are the sons of the kingdom. The tares, the sons of the devil. There wasn't any provision for the sons of the devil. And why should there be? They're not his sons, folks. Why does it seem so alarming to people? Why does it seem such an alarming thing to people? That God would deal graciously and lovingly with his family. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? And where is there any constraint upon God to deal lovingly and graciously with those who are not his family? God did not hate Esau because of who Esau was, what his character was like. Esau was quite a guy. He was a good hunter, probably a good worker. He obviously was a good worker. I mean, he built up quite an empire while Jacob fled from his presence. And I hear Christian after Christian trying to come up with some reason why God would love Jacob. If there is a reason for God loving Jacob, then it's not, it's not of grace. And if, and if there is a reason for God hating Esau, it's of works. 
if there's a reason for God loving you, it's not in me. It's not a grace. Oh, Steve, I just, I, I'm just not sure God loves me. I can't believe. Why would God love me? Don't stop. Stop asking why God loves you, because you're. The, the the implication, the inference, the, the the thought in your in your mind there is going in the wrong direction. You're you're thinking God, there must be something good in you to make you acceptable to God. That destroys grace. God deals in grace with His family. It is not based upon what we do. Ever. 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 Okay, ever. From the beginning to the end. Alpha to Omega. Okay? From the start to the finish. Never in the whole entire history of human mankind has a person ever been saved by what they do. It's always been by grace. It always will be by grace. It is not based upon what we do. But modern Christianity in particular has stressed the human aspect of it and they've left out the finished work of Christ. I run the risk, on the other hand, of ignoring the responsibility of Christians and exalting the finished work of Christ. I try not to do that when we reach passages of Scripture that say lie not one to another, I don't think you should lie to one another. I absolutely believe that's a Christian responsibility, that you are to walk according to the grace that is given to you, that you're to pray without ceasing. I also feel it's a responsibility to believe the Word of God. In fact, I believe that's your primary responsibility. I believe you have a responsibility to give thanks for all things. And very few Christians I know do that. I believe you have a responsibility to walk as who you are, righteous. Most Christians I know don't even know that they're righteous. To walk according to the Spirit, not the flesh, grace, not law. To be responsible enough to know that you are dead to the law, that you might bear fruit unto God. So, folks, we can talk about responsibility. I'm more than happy to. But you got to be fair. The great bulk of Scripture deals with the person and work of Jesus Christ, and by far and away, the great bulk of modern preaching is on human responsibility. From accepting Christ to go to heaven on down to making sure you succeed in getting there which is not the Christianity of this book. This book is not a road map for you. It is the revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Yes, the modern evangelical religious system based on works and human merit, which calls itself Christianity, has bamboozled us. They've lied to you, folks. They've lied to you. I don't know how to put it any plainer than that. But this is nothing new. Authentic Christianity has stood before that religious system for nearly 2,000 years with its very identity hijacked. Now that may sound alarming and unbelievable to many of you until we come to realize that this is how God intended it to be and that it works for our ultimate good. What I find most remarkable is how that this sanctified life mirrors the very life of our Savior Himself who stood before the exact same identical opposition to truth. We can take comfort in the fact that we will endure because His Word sustains and upholds us. It is His love and His grace and His mercy that will deliver us. God loved Jacob by grace. He hated Esau because Esau was not a member of his family. Does that make God unrighteous? Verse 14, and that's where we'll pick up next time. I love you all. I truly do. 
This is Steve. Thanks for watching.